This is episode 31 of EO Radio Show. In this episode, I expand on an important concept that often comes up for private foundations when addressing the rules that require use of a minimum amount each year for charitable purposes. This is known in the industry as the minimum distribution requirement. In the last episode, I talked about the general rules that apply for computing a foundation's distributable amount for the year, which is equal to the foundation's minimum investment return with a number of adjustments. Today, we take a closer look at how to satisfy the minimum distribution rules by setting aside funds for a future purpose, and I'll tell you a true story of a private foundation's amazing resilience in using the set-aside rules in the face of regulatory roadblocks. Welcome to the EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource, brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Ferella Braun & Martel. My name is Cynthia Rowland. And I'm a partner at Ferella. I'm a business and tax lawyer with more than 30 years of experience advising clients on nonprofit and charity law. Through this podcast, our lawyers and guests will discuss a range of legal and business issues impacting the nonprofit world because we understand you work hard every day to make your community a better place to live and do business. Many of our programs focus on the basics, and at times we'll do a deep dive into narrow and complicated legal issues. Again, welcome to the EO Radio Show. We're glad you're here. Let's start this episode on set-asides with a reminder of the big picture context for these minimum distribution rules. Every year, a private foundation determines its distributable amount. The distributable amount calculated for the year must be distributed as qualifying distributions by the end of the following tax year. A foundation that distributes more than is required can carry forward the excess for a period of five tax years immediately following the tax year in which the excess was created or calculated. Like the other excise taxes that apply to private foundations, the tax penalties for violating these rules are so steep that it is never a good idea to ignore the rules. A foundation that fails to pay out the distributable amount in a timely manner is subject to a 30% excise tax under Section 4942 of the Internal Revenue Code on the undistributed income. The excise tax is charged for each tax year or partial year that the deficiency remains uncorrected. And on top of that, an additional 100% tax is triggered if the foundation fails to make up the deficient distribution within 90 days of receiving notification from the IRS of its failure to make the minimum distributions. For the detailed general rules, you may want to listen to episode 30, which covers all these defined terms. But in today's episode, we're going to focus just on the special set-aside rule that can provide considerable flexibility for a private foundation when it wants to use its resources for a big project but doesn't want to deplete its investment assets. So let's put some numbers on this for context. Suppose a private foundation has $1 million of investment assets that generate $50,000 in net earnings each year. The foundation wants to improve its real property, say, add a wing to the building or something like that. If the improvement budget is $250,000, it will take five years to save up enough to pay for such a big project. The foundation could take the $250,000 out of corpus, but then it would only have $750,000 to invest going forward. Unless it has some extraordinary returns, the foundation is unlikely to reach the original $1 million of investment assets anytime soon, if ever. Enter the concept of set-asides. Internal Revenue Code Section 4942G2 provides the rules for private foundations that want to save up the earnings and not make charitable grants in the full amount of the minimum distribution requirement in a particular year. This charitable set-aside provision allows the private foundation to hold on to these amounts for a specific project, but only if the foundation agrees that the amount will actually be paid within five years and meets either a suitability test or a cash distribution test. The policy behind the set-aside exception to allow a set-aside in lieu of mandatory annual use of funds is to allow the exception in situations, quoting from the Treasury regs here, in which long-term grants or expenditures are made in order to assure the continuity of particular charitable projects or program-related investments, or where grants are made as part of a matching grant program. Examples in the regulations of specific projects for which set-asides may be appropriate include a plan 
for a building to house the direct exempt activities of the foundation, such as a museum building, a plan to purchase, say, a large group of paintings all at once for a price that is more than one year's income, or a plan to fund a specific research program that requires an accumulation of funds before the research can begin. There are many, many private letter rulings where the private foundations have sought IRS approval of set-asides in these and a variety of other situations. The request for approval from the IRS for a set-aside ruling is made using the IRS Form 8940, which is a catch-all form that covers a variety of types of determination letters that charitable organizations need. There is a fee for this request, and it changes each year. So it is important to check the IRS website for the current cost and the current form. So once the decision is made that a set-aside ruling would be of great benefit to the private foundation, the next step is to file this Form 8940. If the attachments to the 8940 and the explanations meet the requirements of Code Section 4942G2, the IRS will issue a determination letter in response to the request and will agree that the private foundation may treat the amount set aside for a specific charitable project is a qualifying distribution in the year of the set-aside rather than in the year in which it is actually paid. So here are the six points that the foundation must include in the ruling request. Number one, a description of the nature and purposes of the project and the amount of the set-aside request. Number two, a statement providing amounts and dates of planned additions to the set-aside after its initial establishment, if any. Number three, an explanation of why the project can be better accomplished by a set-aside rather than an immediate payment of funds. Number four, a description of the project, including estimated costs, sources of any future funds expected to be used to complete the project, and the location of any physical facilities to be acquired or constructed as part of the project. Number five, a statement by an appropriate foundation manager that the amounts to be set aside will actually be paid within a specified period of time that ends not more than 60 months after the day of the first set aside, or a statement showing good cause why the period for paying the amount set aside should be extended. And number six, the good cause statement must include a showing that the proposed project could not be divided into two or more smaller projects covering periods of no more than 60 months each. And if needed, that statement also needs to state the extension of time required. Note that the ruling request must be submitted before the end of the tax year in which the amount is to be set aside. A recently issued letter ruling that was published early in 2023 had an interesting set of facts and is a nice contemporary illustration of how a set-aside can work. In private letter ruling 20230214, linked in the show notes if you want to read it, a private foundation requested approval of a set-aside. The foundation's mission consists of serving writers and visual artists from all walks of life by providing them time and space in which to work without disturbance. The ruling says that the foundation provides residency for artists and writers for weeks at a time. The residencies take place on foundation property, which apparently is a space that has been converted from some other use to residential use. The space to be used for the residencies apparently also required extensive renovation. The foundation requested the set aside for the year for which the request was made for the purpose of providing needed renovations to the space to allow the residencies to stay open throughout the year, as well as to upgrade the current conditions and add additional space. So that was the basic request. Interestingly, the applicant foundation had already requested and been approved set-asides in four prior years for the same renovation project. As a side note, letter rulings are redacted to hide any confidential taxpayer information. And in this particular ruling, the years were redacted, so I don't know what years were involved. But to make it easier for listeners to follow the story, I'm going to make up the years involved. As you'll see with the unfolding story, we can infer that one of the relevant years was 2020, and I'll just take the liberty of filling in the other years before and after that. Just for fun, and I don't have any idea which foundation this was or where it was located, but for purposes of our story, let's imagine that the property was, say, a ranch property within city limits. Let's imagine it has a historic residence and various barns and outbuildings say, on the coast somewhere with magnificent views or bordering a national park or something like that. So back to what we can glean from the ruling. 
Several years ago, this foundation hired a noted architectural firm to lead the project. To give us a timeline for the storytelling purposes, let's peg that at, say, 2015. In 2016, the foundation expanded the scope of the project to include a second structure. The foundation then formally hired a building firm and thought that the project would proceed and be completed in a number of months. However, later in 2017, the town planner told the foundation that a number of variances would be required due to the highly sensitive nature of the environment. From the time the foundation was notified by the town planner until the COVID pandemic hit, the foundation worked diligently to comply with the requirements of the town and to obtain the many permits required. The COVID global pandemic then halted the project. During the pandemic, the foundation sought updates from all parties involved in the project and worked to obtain a hearing date with the town zoning board. Due to remote work requirements within all relevant government departments and the resulting backlog of cases, the project was further delayed. During this time, the foundation continued to work on adjustments to the planned site with continued feedback from the town, and the foundation was finally able to file revised project plans in, let's say, 2021. Later in 21, the town zoning board finally held a public hearing using a Zoom conference call, and the foundation's project plans were approved by the town and variances were permitted. However, the foundation could not begin the project without the approval from other regulatory bodies. While awaiting the next approval, the foundation conducted an asbestos test on the property, which, of course, resulted in abatement work that was completed and certified, let's say, early in 2021. In mid-spring of 2021, we can infer, again, I'm just guessing at the years here, so let's just say it was mid-spring of 21, when the next regulatory body finally issued the required permit, which was then submitted to another department for review and approval. In late spring of 2021, that body issued a permit to the foundation, which allowed it to apply for a building permit in the summer of 21. The foundation explained in its application for the set-aside approval that once the final building permit is obtained, work on the project can finally begin. Hooray! At the time of the filing of the application to the IRS, the foundation reported that it had already paid a certain amount to various architects, surveyors, landscapers, attorneys, appraisers, and the general contractor before the construction has even started for the renovation project. The estimated cost of this renovation was stated to be in excess of a gazillion dollars. Just kidding. The ruling doesn't disclose the amount, and letter rulings never intentionally border on hyperbole or hilarity. But this one is a wonderful example of the unrelenting gauntlet of government approvals needed to accomplish charitable objectives. Anyway, back to the story. The foundation in the ruling request represented that during 2021, it expected to complete and pay out the charitable set-asides for the prior years, let's just imagine it was 2016 to 2019, for project-related costs, which expenditures will be made in less than 60 months after that first set-aside year. The last payout of all of the set-asides will be in, let's just guess here, 2026, which, if the set-aside in this ruling request relates to the year 2021, would be not later than five years after the set-aside in this particular request. The Ever Patient Foundation explained to the IRS that it believed that this project can be best accomplished by a set-aside rather than an immediate payment of funds, since it would not be prudent for the foundation to prepay funds to contractors and professionals for work that has not yet even started. The foundation explained to the IRS that the requested set-aside approach would allow it to maximize control over the project with the goal of achieving a better result. The IRS agreed and issued the ruling sometime in 2022, and then it was published in 2023. Presumably, the ruling was granted before the foundation's 990 PF was due in 2021. A couple of practical notes here. The IRS can sometimes be very slow to respond to ruling requests, and the set-aside must be requested before the end of the tax year for which the requesting foundation needs to know that its set-aside is approved. The timing becomes really important because foundations need to know their qualifying distributions by the time they file their annual Form 990-PF. With extensions properly requested, the 990-PF is usually due by the 15th day of the 11th month after the close of the foundation's tax year. So for calendar year foundations, that's November 15 as the final due date. So if I were advising a foundation about how far in advance to request a set-aside ruling, I'd say you really want to get it submitted by the fall, say September, of the year for which you'll want to have the qualifying set aside. 
So if you send Form 8940 in September of 2023, you might well have the ruling by November of 24, when the 2023 Form 990 PF is due. Obviously, the earlier the request is submitted, the better, but you can't do it so early that the required commitments and conditions can't be described in detail. Remember the six factors I outlined a few minutes ago. The IRS doesn't like to rule on hypothetical scenarios. Let's turn to a few less interesting tidbits now of this set-aside rules that allow some exceptions. There's also a rarely used rule for contingent set-asides when a private foundation is involved in litigation and can't distribute assets or income because of a court order. Details for requesting approval of a set-aside in that circumstance is also listed in the instructions to the Form 8940. There's also a special cash distribution test that may help out certain new or newly funded private foundations. This rule is a three-part mechanical test that does not rely on the suitability of the set-aside to the exempt purpose we were just talking about in the context of our example ruling. Anyway, this mechanical three-part test principally applies to new or newly funded private foundations that attempt to start long-term projects in their early years. This rule can be helpful if, during the first four taxable years after the foundation was created or became a private foundation, it identifies a specific project which can't be completed by the end of the taxable year in which the set-aside is made. That's the first part of the test. Second, the foundation still has to make distributions, but calculated on a more lenient formula over the first four years. Under this formula, the new or newly funded foundation calculates its minimum by determining the following amounts. 20% of the foundation's distributable amount for the first taxable year of the four-year startup period, 40% of such amount for the second taxable year, 60% of the amount for the third taxable year, and 80% of the distributable amount for the fourth taxable year. But note that the entire aggregate amount of that calculation can be distributed any time in the five-year startup period. So let's put some numbers on this formula. Going back to my first hypothetical foundation at the beginning of this episode, which had a million dollars of investment assets. So using the 20, 40, 60, 80 ramp up percentages, by the end of the first four years, this hypothetical foundation will calculate the required distributions in those four years as, in our example, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, and 40,000 for a total of 100,000 that must be distributed by the end of year five. That's about half of the 200,000 that would have applied if the foundation were making the actual minimum distribution at the rate of 50,000 per year for each year. Anyway, the third and last part of the cash distribution test is that the foundation relying on this exception usually must make cash distributions equal to 100% of its distributable amount during each taxable year after the four-year startup period ends. There are a few exceptions to these rules, so if a newly created or newly funded private foundation wants to take advantage of the lenient ramp-up distribution requirements, check the regulations to make sure that all the details are addressed. Before we wrap up today, keep in mind that these Section 4942 excise taxes on failure to make qualifying distributions do not apply to private operating foundations. Episode 18 of EO Radio Show is the nonprofit basics episode that describes the requirements for qualification as an operating foundation. So check that out if you want to explore those rules. So that's all for this episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to more resources on set-asides and the link to the 2023 letter ruling if you want to read the entire published ruling. I'm Cynthia Rowland, and you've been listening to EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource, brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Varela Braun and Martel. If you have suggestions for topics you would like for us to discuss, please email us at eoradioshow at fbm.com. That's eoradioshow at fbm.com. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, make a difference. Make a difference.